Thank you, everybody. Um, so thanks for coming. As I, I said a bit earlier that we're going to have a minute of silence every 20 minutes. And this is, uh, so someone's going to time the 20 minutes and it's going to sound a bell. And then someone else is going to time a minute. This is just to give, um, give me a break, give everyone a break. Recognize that some of us, English is not our, speak, our first language. So uh, it's, we're always making the effort of translating in our heads and doing this work. So just to kind of give us a break. And everyone else to just get your head around maybe what I'm saying, trying to make sense of it. So, uh, and that also helps me the timing. <clears throat> okay, the microphone is not working, but I will. Do, can you all hear me? Yes. Is everyone okay with the temperature? Do you need to take your sweaters off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is one of the analysis that we developed from a big, a big project called Latin American Anti-Racism in a Post-Racial Age. So this a specific, um, a pro what I'm going to present is an analysis that crosses four of the four sites of the project. This was, I'm just putting you here, the names of all the people that participated. So what I'm going to say draws on field work that was uh, done by our postdocs in all of the countries and by uh, an analysis that was developed through um, various meetings and uh, a joint analysis. So this is not just my work, although it was developed by Mara Viveros and myself, but it is reflecting a larger you know, group. I just want you to see all of them, all of the people that participated, the main group. This was uh, the co-investigators and um, international advisors, the co-investigators in each country, <coughs> the research assistants, and the postdocs. So some of you might know some of them. Uh, this big project uh, is like, it it's, was a really um, big effort to put together research in four countries in Latin America, Mexico, Ecuador, Brazil, and Colombia. It is comparative and relational. It looks at 24 cases in, in an intensive way, but a variety more of more uh, contextual cases. It looks at inter, um, anti racist actions and discourses of organizations, state institutions, social grassroots movements, and also legal cases that mostly bring together the work of indigenous and black people. So it tries to make a conversation. So it's not just about black people, it's not about just indigenous people. And we, it's based on nine months still work in all of these sites uh, with lots of different things. One big methodologic framework that we use that I find it very inspiring to think about the whole of the project is that, is this of asking the other question, which you know, some of you might have come across in the work of Matsuda in 1991, who was like, I, I read it, I was like, oh, this is so interesting to frame anti anti intersectionality and anti-racism. And she wrote, when I see something that looks racist, I ask, where is the patriarchy in this? When I see something that looks sexist, I ask, where is the heterosexism in this? When I see something that looks homophobic, I ask, where are the class interests in this? So facing anti-racism in, in Latin America, particularly in all this scenario that I show you, we were asking what is hegemonic in the resistance against racism and what is the resistance within the dominant racial order. So we're trying to make, constantly make the other question to help us like open up our, our thinking and our possibilities. Okay, before I enter into the specifics of the paper, I also want to mention two big things that are framing the overall project. One is one of our, like, I don't know if it was also an inspiration, but also a result is that we noticed that there is a turn to anti-racism in Latin America. You have to, but some of you that are not familiar with Latin America, there's been a long denial that racism exists, but under the assumption that mixed race societies, because they are mixed, and they, they held this mixture racial discourses. They don't deal with racism because everybody's mixed. Everybody <coughs> loves each other because they're all mixed. So based on that, uh, we have done many, uh, a group, big group of people. We have been working for the last 30 years 
20, 30 years on describing and analyzing how racism works and how, what it does and that it exists. And now what we see is that there's also not only that's being sort of like taken on, but there's also, <coughs> and of course it's not just because academics, but because of social mobilization and many other global issues. Uh, <coughs> but we also see there is a turn to anti-racism. There's also a lot of, um, we notice that there are many more actions, that there are legislations, that there has been a build up of different initiatives throughout the region where, uh, apart from mobilization from grassroots, there is um, the impetus that Durban, the conference in 2001 on, on racism initiated. So there are lots of census and the statistics. So there's like a, a booming place for understanding and exploring a variety of anti-racist action. And with these, I'm including from state as well to NGOs, as well to legal framework. Okay. And something we realized during this, um, exploring this turn to anti-racism is a variety of what we call grammars of anti-racism. So basically we realized that many organizations were able to be very explicit that they were doing anti-racist work. So we call them that, you know, explicit grammars of anti-racism. You know, they talk about race, they talk about racism, they talk about anti-racism as such. But there are many others that we frame uh, within the alternative grammars of anti-racism that some of the struggles that they push and they, they promote or they are um, embedded, um, engaged with do not always or comfortably name racism. They might be used strategically or not. And, <laughs> and, and they can have effects that are uh, but however, their struggles can have effects that are structurally anti-racist. So that was something interesting to notice because it's not as straightforward. And also that gave us, that, that everyone says like, yes, this is an anti-racist struggle. Although what they work, the people involved are racialized, negatively racialized. Or the work that they promote actually end up contributing to uh, challenging racism in a much more structural, structural way. So that's kind of quite interesting and important. Okay, so this was just the context. Okay, what are the key questions of what I want to present to you today? First of all, that uh, what the key questions that guide our, um, this analysis of intersectionality and anti-racism is the, how the intersectional subject, individual or collective, is producing new anti-racist practices. And this is kind of what we were trying to, to locate, saying that we, we think it, uh, uh, the new anti-racist, the intersectional subject is producing anti-racist subjects, and how is it that that's happening? And we are asking about this connection between gender repertoires and stereotypes, and how they have been mobilized or not within anti-racist practice. So what happens when race and gender are linked up in efforts of anti-racism? Okay, and the key lessons that I think we can get off, and maybe this is the main things that you can take with you, that are like very, very abstracted summary, is like intersectionality, and maybe a provocation. Intersectionality mm -hmm. is at play in social life and action, whether it's recognized or not, whether we think it is or not, whether we, you know. Uh, whether we use it, we take it on board as a, as a methodology, as a, as a perspective. There are effects mobilized by such presence, whether they are noticed or not, as well. Mm -hmm. And in addition, we can, if we wanted, decide to use intersectionality as a strategy or as a tool for analysis and for action. You know, and this is what we are wondering, how much is it it's a strategy of the organizations of the of of the work. And regardless, go back to number one. Right? So I think that's kind of my <laughs> summary of my perspective on this. So what are the theoretical starting points? Well, first of all, anti-racism, anti-racist struggle is never an isolated struggle, right? It's always accompanied by a variety of other, other um, other struggles, you know, it's about anti-sexism, anti-capitalism, not always in the same, uh, in the same um, 
conjunction or with the same F, uh, strength, but anti-racism is not on its own, never. Uh, we, we have seen this in this, uh, with all the work on, anti, on, uh, on intersectionality, that the core of the experience of sexism <coughs> is racialized, and at the same time, racism is marked by gender and sexuality. And this is affected by class-based practices, generational, geographical, or national distinctions, and then we can add more to this understanding. But yeah, I mean, this is your, and, uh, your intersectionality one-on-one situation. This experience as well, and this is very important for, specifically for what I want to present to you today, is that they can only be understood in a specific and contextualized manner. The question for intersectionality is an empirical question. We cannot use <coughs> one thing that has been developed, blatantly put it in another place. We need to see from the ground up, from this specific place, what's going on here. And this, because these are co-constructed, they are contextual, these experiences uh, of sexism, of racism. Okay. Another two things that we're using in this paper is um, gender repertoires and gender stereotypes. And we're trying to see how these are mobilized within anti-racist struggle. So I just wanted to clarify what are we understanding by gender stereotype and gender repertoire. So by gender repertoire, we refer to the set of gender elements available to people in groups for their social and public behavior, right? And these are like situated, they are particular to, to specific social racial contexts. And by gender stereotypes, we want to, um, we mean, you know, this very minimum and simple and predictable ways of rationalizing certain behaviors relating in this case to black and indigenous <coughs> men and women. So what we try to do in this work is seek to give an account of how these gender repertoires and gender stereotypes are politically mobilized through anti-racist struggle. Okay. So looking at all these data of the project and all these different cases, uh, we chose ones where we saw that gender repertoires and stereotypes were being mobilized through the work. And we found, we like to do like our schemes and you know, like little <laughs> schemas of things. And we found that we could organize these experiences in four intersectional axes that I'm gonna discuss through the paper. One of them, and there are all different ways of linking these aspects. One of them is anti-racist actions that reclaim black men's access to canonical masculinity. The second one is anti-racist actions that seek the benefits of femininity and beauty for black women. The third one is anti-racist actions that capitalize on gender stereotypes. And finally, anti-racist actions that expand and politicize notions of femininity, motherhood, and care. Yeah. So I'm going to explain how we're positioning or understanding intersectionality and then go into each of them, OK? OK, so okay, intersectionality first, you know, we always go straight to Kimberly Crenshaw and think that's the start, that's where the term generates. But actually, there's been a more than two centuries of intersectional approaches, whether they've been called or not like that. So we can trace them to many different people, many different women that were, um, particularly women, that were doing this specific work. Uh, <coughs> so um, in France, Olympe de Go, Go, I can't pronounce it very well, okay. Uh, in the Declaration of the Rights of Women, of Women, compare colonial domination with patriarchal oppression and establish analogies between women and slave peoples. Sojourner Truth in 1851 in the Women's Rights Convention in Ohio highlighted the white bourgeois bias that was prevalent at the time. In Latin America, a Brazilian feminist like Teresa Santos, Leila Gonzalez, and Sueli Carneiro posed questions in the 1980s about the overlapping of the triad race, class, gender. But we know that it is with Kimberly Crenshaw, and I'm surely I'm missing people, and this is not like a comprehensive history, but just wanted to give those other pointers. 
in the 1990s coined the term intersectionality in two legal publications and succinctly and clearly articulated the need <coughs> to consider the multiplicity of oppressions and power relations that cross over each other within our everyday personal and collective experience. Um, so there are many critiques and issues around intersectionality, how do you apply it, if it's identity based, if it's structural or political, or how to how to take this on board. The way we decided to work with it is thinking about it in terms of political intersectionality. With this we mean that we want to see uh, we want to see it emanating, drawing from the field, from the organizations. It is an applied perspective, an applied dimension of structural intersectionality. And we think we want to think about it as how can intersectionality work as a political intervention? We want to see it in its like uh, working dimension, right? And we think this way allow us to get out of the theoretical dilemma between identity-based <coughs> perspectives that insist of listing, you know, well, if you are this kind of person, you know, with this list of identities, Therefore, you have less or more intersectionality going on, or you know, and we think that that's not the way, really, uh, rich way. It's not very interesting because it doesn't let us draw from the praxis of the organisations and the social movements working in the face of inequality. Okay, uh, one of the lessons of this intersectional turn that we are also detecting he here is that um, the link between race and gender is not only inevitable, but also productive for progressive social change, even if this sometimes is opaque and ambivalent. So what we mean by this is that what we have found is that the struggle to access racial dignity sometimes gets enmeshed with a reclamation of the markers of what's the human or normal, and that might be perceived as being <coughs> what belongs to the dominant groups. So sometimes there could be a confusion. Are we really asking for progressiveness, or we just want to enter established already place of the human you know, or the normal, which belongs usually to you know, white or mestizo in the Latin American case, middle or upper class citizens, etc. right? So the struggle sometimes, you know, can imply a reclamation of these markers. The struggle can also make us use forms of masculinities and femininities that are not necessarily emancipatory. So because people, and you will see in the examples, are reclaiming a space within uh, areas that have been I mean, that are part of human dignity and where they have been rejected, that they have been rejected to be in, uh, sometimes these struggles don't necessarily question even the gendered subject, right? And it could then become not quite emancipatory in the sense, you know. So it, it's a bit <coughs> tricky. I hope that makes sense. I mean, I will explain a bit more what we mean by this choreography, you know, when you are like trying to unite these gender repertoires and stereotypes in the anti-racist action, many things happen that are maybe unexpected, that are not necessarily very clear cut in advance. Okay. Let's start with the first set of access, which is anti-racist actions that reclaim black men's access to canonical masculinity. I'm going to read a little bit because it's so nicely written. I know it's not nice, so nice, but I'll read very well, you see. Um, in Colombia, Ecuador, and Brazil, we found a series of struggles waged by black men who had, racially, who had been racially discriminated against in the labor market, the armed forces, and professional soccer. John Jack Becerra, who is this man here, a Colombian worker who was unfairly dismissed and eventually won a case alleging racial discrimination against his employers. Michael Arce, an Ecuadorian who is a top man. An Ecuadorian cadet who won Ecuador's first hate, hate crime case against the military academy. And the Brazilian soccer player Mario Lucio Duarte, who is also called Araña who became involved in anti-racist campaigning after having racist insults hurled at him during a match, but ended up being fired from his team 
and was later accused of homophobia. Each of these men, in their struggles against racial discrimination, called not only for repar reparations of racist violations, but also, even if not explicitly, for access to the benefits of canonical masculinity, which is codified as white and bestows dignity and rights. The masculinity that each of them embodies is perceived as substandard in relation to the norm by which they are measured. Unemployment meant John Jack could not provide for his family. Michael was not considered to be man enough to pass the test stipulated by the military service. Mario Lucio was belittled by racial abuse on the soccer field and afterwards was condemned for making homophobic comments and not honoring his own struggle against racism. He was asked to cool down, which is a way of trying to restore a particular version of liberal masculinity. In this way, attempting to rid themselves of these negative stereotypes, which mark them as deficient men, who are not seen to embody the image of a good breadwinner or the stoic liberal modern man, can be perceived as part of their struggles. Was that 20 minutes? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll just finish this, this sentence. The anti-racist actions that these men undertake try to restore their sense of dignity, as well as their possibility of accessing the opportunities that they have been denied in their masculine position. They are calling upon their perceived right to benefit from the patriarchal dividend, the advantages that the, advantages the men um, no, the advantages the men command as the dominant group. So they all are saying, we want the possibilities of working under decent conditions. Michael Larson refers to the violence of humiliation and how his virility was attacked. Aranya tries to recoup his dignity. So how one does respond to situations where the action against racism is codified in terms of gender? You know, how do we do that? So in that point. We're going to have a minute of silence. Who Vivian is going to take? Okay. What we found here in this case is that an intersectional modality around accessing canonical gender normativity is at play. And we ask these racist questions more than, you know, given like specific answers, but it raises interesting questions. Does access to these spaces of canonical masculinity risk reinforcing then them as newly multicultural spaces of heterosexist oppression. It's like this one liberation then causes another sort of way for another oppression. Second, and opening the discussion to race class intersections, do these particular strategies leave unquestioned the inherently capitalist character of the workplace, the military, the sports industry, <coughs> right? Okay, the second set of the second axis anti-racist actions that seek the benefits of femininity and beauty for black women. Here we explore the cases of two organizations, one Colombian, Amafrocol, and one Brazilian, Manifesto Crespo. They, these um, cases open up spaces that were previously denied to certain groups of women, particularly, uh, and they aim, they are aimed at accessing and disrupting gender norms the spaces that they, they open. Repertoires of femininity and beauty are mobilized and expand by providing black women access to aesthetic care and products for Afro hair. This access makes possible for them to reorganize their relationship within the social world and combat racial stereotypes. So these organizations are all about thinking around, uh, well, they have a variety of things. I mean, Manifesto Crespo is specifically trying to rescue the histories of hair, braiding of different ways of styling hair, and in doing that, getting women together to have debates and to have discussions around <coughs> that. The second one, Amafrocol, is a network of organizations in Colombia that meet every year to have a big uh, festival where it's all about discussing hair, but through that, challenging sexism, building bridges, sorority, thinking about networks between women. Um, so they sort of, this, they want to develop and promote Afro hair in a, in a way to resist sexism and racism. One of them, just to give you a sense of one of the participants, she, she said this in an interview, uh, Lina Lupumi. 
she says, we have been assigned characteristics, certain roles and behaviors that we should have and that we're being trained for, and they are imposed on us and they penetrate our bodies. When they say that your hair isn't professional, that is the hair that is part of my head, like my arms, like my head, like my eyes, like my mouth, isn't professional, they are taking away my legitimacy as a person. I think that they start mutilating us, and from when we're children, we are receiving all this information, and they make us question our value as people. So she really clearly is, is linking processes of dehumanization uh, to give new meaning you know, to the Afro hair and turn it into an instrument for combating racism using the body. Right? So it's very interesting how they all kind of get together and try to talk about beauty as a collective, pra as a collective practice as well as a personal enjoyment, a space for personal enjoyment. Uh, <clears throat> And they exchange experiences of solidarity, accompaniment, affection, that can bloom within these spaces, right? So the political dimension of this project rests on an emotional network constructed among these women so that they do not stand alone before the male gaze or before, you know, the, the white male gaze too. Okay, Manifesto Crespo. It's, uh, they also center, as I said, around, around the hair, but they also notice that there is an ambivalent dynamic going on that provides a space for vindication, but at the same time feeds into the beauty industry. One of the members of, of this <coughs> collective said, despite having advanced in the acceptance of black aesthetics, the dictatorship of curly hair that is presented as an ideal gives growth to the cosmetic industry that takes even more money for white people, owners of the big brands. So what is, is they are very clear that when they talk about this dictatorship of the curl, that there is a whole thing going on that is feeding to uh, black women that are trying to connect again with their hair in the case of Brazil, is that, okay, but how curly is your hair, you know? What kind of curl it is? It is a right curl, is it like two, Tight, is it? That, and that becomes another way of colorism, you know, colorism through through the hair, and it becomes an element that simultaneously unites and divides, where racism is reactivated within the collective. And they are very clear at dealing with this and working through this. So they are very interesting organizations. Both of them, the women of Amafropol and Manifesto Crespo, seek to reclaim a reconnection to their bodies which has been mutilated by racism. This, this reclamation critiques the mestizo and white beauty standards. Afro hair then you know, um, becomes a way of revaluing, demystifying, <coughs> accepting. You know. And they, they, uh, they, it raises the question, what should one do with hair that is a potent symbol of identification, contempt, and racist oppression against black women. You know, how to mobilize it with all of this. They raise that kind of a hair question and, and as a way to campaign and, you know, it's interesting. However, as well, um, it is the Afro hair movement, in a way, is a space of ambivalence because internalized sexism can be reactivated when the, um, within, uh, within the women participated or the women that these spaces are open to. Um, there are differences in age and generation that are marked, like who can dedicate time and money to get into even the natural hair. So it is, it is a, it's a complicated area. And of course, how much can we, are they critiquing and can we critique beauty as a marker of not only white beauty, but overall the notion of beauty that becomes part of these discourses that not only feeds into the beauty industry, but also keeps reconstructing ideas of femininity and womanhood, right? So, but, you know, can we say to black and indigenous women, oh, do not engage with beauty practices, they are all really bad, when they have been so excluded from even the category woman, right? So it is an interesting question, you know, Black and indigenous people have been historically separated from what, what counts as full humanity. And many black and Latin American feminists 
have asserted that black and indigenous women were not considered as women in the same way as white women who already were marked in the late 19th and 20th centuries as biologically inferior. Slavery and colonization has excluded black and indigenous women from culture defined as a circulation of symbols around the system of matrimonial exchange. They were sexually marked as female, but not as women. So this brings, so if you see, there is an interesting ambivalence that is brought up in this world of um, the Afro hair movement. And, and that's why we call these anti-racist actions that, what did I say? That um, seek the benefits of femininity and beauty for black women. Okay, so I'm going to move now to the third one, uh, the third axis, which is anti-racist actions that capitalize on gender stereotypes. Here we found a very interesting case of an organization called Chao Racismo. And um, what we were looking here, or what we found, is that there are some initiatives that involve ambiguous interactions with gender stereotypes, with the aim of shifting and resignifying them. So this is a Colombian organization composed of black and mestizo men and women who promote racism awareness campaigns and projects in Cali and Bogotá and Cartagena in Colombia. Under the leadership of this man that is sitting on the left, uh, left side, um, right Charupi, they want, their main uh, aim is to challenge the, the association of blackness with poverty. They want to raise inspirational, motivational um, figures that people can emulate, and they see like they want to make the appearance of black people as chic fashion, fashion sexy and chic, and they want to kind of reverse <coughs> that linkage with poverty. So they do this through a very series of inspirational and sensory strategies on multiple media and public platforms, including advertisement, workplaces, beauty pageants, music, and among young people, to awaken this aspiration, you know? They want to put, she says, Charupi says, I want, you know, that to show an image of blackness that is so successful and attractive that white people will want to reproduce and consume it. Literally, you know, he just says this by wearing the t-shirt. So he produces this, they produce these t-shirts, they go to beauty pageants and get all the women wearing them so that blackness is associated with beauty, with success, and they get themselves with like video producers and get the t-shirts in like these amazing music videos so that people will just see this is very, very good. Uh, however, you know, we, we feel like he would say things like, Okay, people say black people are good in bed. Well, yes, we are good in bed. Let's use that and be very good in bed and also be very good in business and be very good, you know. So he's trying to say we're not going to demythify that. Yeah, we're going to be sexy and we're going to be chic and we're going to, yeah. So it's kind of expanding and using the stereotypes to further a cause, um, an anti racist cause, you know. Um, so Charupi's words um, and his work uh, evoke a practical logic that responds to racism by attempting to increase visibility, inclusion, and diversity in institutional spaces. Thus, the positioning of the brand, Chao Racismo, is presented as a solution to racism, which is understood as a series of individual prejudices and attitudes that can be reversed if people are just wearing the t-shirt and being nice to each other. The anti-racist solution proposes, therefore, to revisit the spaces that have been socially assigned to black populations, like the cultural, the musical, the sexual, and invest in expanding and resignifying the racialized image of black men and women, employing the sensual and inspirational and recycling gender stereotypes in pursuit of social mobility. So it is a very entrepreneurial anti-racism, we call it, that wants to kind of capitalize and move on in that, in that scene. Okay, the final, are you all okay? Yes. Okay, I'm getting there. The <laughs> final um, axis is anti-racist actions that expand and politicize notions of femininity, motherhood, and care. Here, basically, we, we, we think around this question, what happens when negatively racialized women 
strategically use their social role as mothers or daughters to lend legitimacy to the struggles in the public sphere. Here I have four cases. I can't talk about them all in detail there <coughs> because of time. But it's basically women that um, have used um, certain values that are associated it with the private sphere and are used, uh, perceived as exclusively feminine, and they repackage them strategically in the public sphere in order to critically disrupt the prevalent social order. So the figure of the mother we have seen that has been used in many different uh, social mo mobilizations, you know, the, the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, abolitionism, so where black and indigenous women here, what we see in these cases are exploring <coughs> alternative paths for understanding and building politics within anti-racist action outside of the male channels of the public sphere. So um, I'll just tell you very quickly. Uh, so we have two cases of black women in Ecuador and Brazil. So the mother of Michael Arce who mobilized her own pain as a mother to join with other mothers whose children have been excluded from different areas. And so she kind of has been fighting with him, has been very candidly giving you know, conferences and putting her voice alongside other mothers. This organization called the Red, the, the network, let me just get the net. network of communities and movements against violence in, in Rio de Janeiro, who is a group of 18 mothers that have had their children uh, killed by the police in Rio de Janeiro, uh, killed or disappeared, and they have, a, they are getting together to mobilize a sort of street guerrilla sort of motherhood, you know, where they get together um, and try to politicize this situation and bring attention to their plight as mothers that have been, they fight as mothers and with the womb, they would say, you know. They protest collectively and individually against attacks on their children, mostly men, sons, and they justify their demands by talking about protection of their families, but also of their communities, you know. So in a way, what they do, what is different or interesting, first is that they are black and indigenous, not mestizo women getting organized, which is one very good thing. And also is that it gives a way to an expansion of gender consciousness and offers a new meaning to motherhood as a position that is not only individual, but linked to a collective history. It, it could even be understood as a political task challenging romanticized images of motherly care, you know. So that's quite, quite interesting. Um, and they, they raise the question, can we construct anti-racist action with family life as its base? What would that be like? You know? Should the values of motherhood be a point of reference for politics and progressive social justice? And of course, there are ambivalence, how not to make it suddenly too linked to motherhood in a way that other people cannot participate, others that are not mothers cannot participate, or that it gets sort of, um, co-opted by this space of m motherly, right, of mother motherhood. The other two are indigenous women in Mexico, the other two cases. One is of three indigenous women who were unjustly imprisoned and later given a public apology by the government. They were imprisoned and they were accused, and Jacinta Francisco Maciel, the, the first woman, was um, one of them, because they were charged that they uh, kidnapped some police, federal police. And that was a case made against them and then the <coughs> government had to publicly apologize because not only that was completely impossible but it, it really the limit and mark, they were in jail for more than three years and, and then they give a public apology. <coughs> and Marichui or uh, Maria de Jesus Patricio, who is this woman here, who became uh, the candidate for the presidency in the Mexican 2018 election, and she was put forward as um, the candidate of indigenous peoples, and she fought to get a place as an independent candidate, which she didn't manage, but it created a really interesting controversy. Um, it's a long case, but I just, they all have their specificities, but I want just to point out to um, 
what hap something that happened in the moment the government gave a public apology to Jacinta Francisco Maciel. And there, her, uh, she learned how to speak Spanish within the, the jail because she didn't know how to. And it was a very long process where she was insisting that she was a mother, that she was, so she couldn't have done this, that she wanted to be connected with her children. And nobody took that as a, the mestizo lawyer, so nobody took that as something that was important. Right? So it kind of gave the question of who can afford to be a mother where? Who can afford to use and mobilize that uh, positioning? And um, what happened, like what sorts of motherhood and relationships can mobilize where and where and for what reasons? In the, um, in the, to in the moment of the apology, her daughter, Estela, who is a rural teacher, she went and gave a paper, I mean, uh, present and gave, say some words in behalf, on behalf of her mother, showing a lot of solidarity, a lot of clarity about the injustice that had happened. And, and she closed her speech um, making links, uh, saying, I'm doing this for all of those that cannot speak, for all the other people that have been unfairly imprisoned, and make um, for all the families that have not been able to be connected or have been disrupted by these processes. And, and she says, I'm not here now to tell you that I'm happy, but instead to tell you that hopefully other people's voices will be heard and justice will be done. And she uh, then says, she clearly outlines an intersectional turn at the center of the struggle for justice. Today, she said, it has been shown that being poor, a woman, and indigenous is no reason to be ashamed. Shame today is for those who should be guaranteeing our rights as an ethnic group, as indigenous peoples, and as humans. For Marichui, it's really interesting because the stereotype has been that indigenous men are macho, they take over, they don't give women the space to participate, and what her uh, positioning as the candidate shows is how much indigenous women's indigenous leadership has been uh, in all Latin America that those stereotypes are actually com they are, have been completely challenged and her election is a response of her effort and her work for many years within the indigenous movement and that's another 20 minutes okay um, I will just end by this I mean she said um, her selection inverts the meaning attached to symbol of oppression. And she says, why not a woman? Why not a woman to be press, uh, candidate? The woman has been the symbol of oppression because we are not taken into account. We are considered people of fourth or fifth class. We are tossed aside and we've been told, not only indigenous women, but those from the city too, that our place is at home and that is not true. Okay. And she said, our fight is for our life. She said, uh, she, in her message, she was talking, talking about an ethics of care towards all women, thinking about violence, femicides in Mexico, that say femicides have a color. It's indigenous and brown women, that ones that are being more killed, that are being killed. And, and yeah, OK. I think <coughs> both of them then call for a very a specific social intervention that is anti-racist and anti-sexist and is also anti-capitalist. I mean, they are in a much more radical stance than, than the other cases. So I will we'll make another minute of silence and then I will finish after a bit. So what we saw in this analysis, we see in this analysis is that um, what I hope it has kind of made clear is that it offers us an, a new, or, or not a new, but an interpretative lens for looking at anti-racism through the examination of the effects of intersectionality. The intersection of gender and race makes visible at least four social dynamics that operate in the situations that we have described. The first refers to the specificity of sexism that is wielded against black and indigenous women. The second reveals the internal complexities of masculinities within the gender structures and in relation to other social structures like ethnicity, race, and class. The third refers to the political leadership that black and indigenous women of different generations have assumed in anti-racist struggles that are waged today in Latin America. And the fourth indicates the sexist character of racism 
and the racist character of sexism that are enforced in the region. <coughs> Furthermore, intersectional identifies a gradient of situations from those that explicitly or implicitly reinforce canonical ideas of masculinity or femininity, trying to avoid the disadvantages of ethno-racial identities, to those that question or redefine gender norms or that link the structural inequalities of gender, race and class in the interest of moving towards a transformative political horizon. The anti-racist practices carried out by black men described in this, in this uh, talk tend to defend rather than question the gender order. On the one hand, negatively racialized men are pushed away from the masculine gender canon, feminizing them or painting them as hyper-vira, vir viril, I don't know, <laughs> These men know how the canonical masculinity, uh, that canonical masculinity and access to its symbolic and material benefits are racially marked, which in Latin American context means linked to white or mestizo subjects. Access to such masculinity offers the possibility of overcoming the social inequality that racism produced. So for this reason, in these cases that I presented to you, they seek to distance themselves from the gender stereotypes applied to them as lazy, useless, belligerent, or underdeveloped men, and, or they try to relocate the stereotype within the framework of upward mobility as child racismo, right child rupee, tries to do. Black and indigenous women from different generations are the new political subjects of anti-racist struggles. Adult women are leading or supporting with their communal practices or from an ethics of care, the protest against the violence and dispossession that suffocates their communities, as is exemplified by the political, by the political program of Marichui in Mexico. Black and indigenous women of all ages are giving new meaning to sorority, affects, and family ties, as shown by the mothers of the Red uh, Against Violence in Rio de Janeiro, the collectives of Amafrocol, and Estela Hernandez in defense of her mother. So political intersectionality is expressed in the positioning of some young black women from Amafrocol and Manifesto Crespo that articulate anti-racism, anti-sexism, and anti-capitalism in supporting aesthetic care for black women and in the struggle against beauty stereotypes created by Western societies and their patriarchal, racist, and capitalist advertising strategies. So these women shift their subjective an intersubjected physician from being the ones who give care, you know, in domestic service or caring for dominant classes, to locate themselves as the receivers of aesthetic care that aims to repair the symbolic and material damage inflicted on their bodies by racism. The panorama laid above then presents a continuum of intersectional modalities which we characterize as accessing resignifying and disrupting canonical gender norms. This categorization helps us locate points of reference for thinking about the potentiality of intersectionality for anti-racist action. So some anti-racist action seeks access to the material and symbolic benefits of the canonical gender norms that are an offer. So we see here the fight of John Jack, Michael, Ara Michael Arce, Araña, that they want access to respectability to the normal, you know, moral masculinity and femininity. And some of the women of Amafrocol here too. Other anti-racist action attempts to resignify and give new meaning and reposition gender norms, as the example of child race racism does of uses of hypersexualized black women to associate them with success, achievement, and social mobility. However, some of the anti-racist actions, like those of the mothers of Rio de Janeiro, Lilian Mendez, some of the younger activists of Amafrocol, the indigenous women of Mexico, disrupt the ways that the feminine norms and repertoires operate by injecting political context or character that doesn't normally exist in public declarations or activities. So they are, they are wanting to, uh, their, their struggles are characterized in terms of an ethics of care which ceases to apply solely to the private sphere and is instead converted into a political proposal for the recreation of ties that guarantee everyday conditions of existence for the community. So these three ways, you know, um, are, are interesting and help us to see that this, um, 
they are not lineal or progressive sequences, but they are closing in on the interrelation between gender and race. This reveals that anti-racism never operates alone, and that an anti-racist struggle is developed by people and social groups with multiple affiliations and identities. And also, intersectionality gives an account of oppressions that affect each other mutually and in different and unexpected ways, always within a certain context. So, intersectionality <coughs> doesn't offer one single answer. It helps us make the other question. And I finish. That's it.